Welcome, everybody, to a new episode of Cinematic Realms. I'm your host, John, and with me today is Dan, a.k.a. Voice of Geekdom, and we will be joined by two other guests uh, along the way, uh, Carol Brown, who should be here in a couple minutes, and also Helen, the clueless fan girl. Um, but for now, we're just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hey, Dan, how you doing? It's great to have you on. Hey, it's good to be here. Yeah, yeah, tell uh, tell the folks a bit about yourself and, and what you do. Sure. Um, so I, I have a Tolkien channel, The Voice of Geekdom. Um, uh, eventually, I want to do other things as well. But at the moment, I've been focusing on the Silmarillion. Um, I think most of the people in the chat are regulars who know me already. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I've just started. Um, and at the moment, I've been doing scripted content. So I've been doing just um, short form uh, chapter analysis bits on the Silmarillion um and yeah it's great to be here obviously i'm from england as well so it's um it's the evening for me um <laughs> yeah uh i have to say um i just want to take a minute to talk about your stuff dan i mean i i think that a lot of you know people in in the chat you know they're all part of our slack group so i, I i'm mm -hmm. sure many of them have seen the stuff but for anybody who hasn't you're just doing amazing stuff and you know especially as a Tolkien fan I you know I'd be really excited watching your stuff it, it's great so <laughs> so anybody who hasn't uh, seen uh, his stuff yet I have linked his channel in the description uh, so go ahead and, and check that out please smashing yeah, so uh, it turns out Carol is trying to get her audio working, so hopefully uh, um, she'll be able to, to join us soon, and, and Helen should be on her way too. But uh, I'm going to start off, before we talk about our topic, which is actually the 1977 animated version of The Hobbit, I, I just want to uh, ask you real quick, what's your... Uh, you know, sort of background with Tolkien's novel and, you know, and, and what's your impression of it? Sure. Uh, the, the Hobbit was, I think it was more or less the first novel I ever wrote, uh, ever, ever wrote, ever read. Um, <laughs> I think it was, my, my dad read it to me when I was about six or seven. Um, and when I say first novel, it's the first novel with, you know, chapters and, you know, I, I read sort of kids books beforehand, but, um, but it was, it, when my dad finished reading it to me, by the time he'd finished it, I was fairly confident I could read this book myself, and I did. So I read The Hobbit for the first time, very, very young. Um, and yeah, it was basically the first book that ever kind of hit me and turned me into a reader. Um, and yeah, and I read it repeatedly after that as well, because um, you know what it's like getting into something young when you, when you love it, but don't quite understand it. You want to just read it over and over. Um, so yeah, I love love the book um, Hobbit. Um, I think it's I think it's one of the best children's books ever written. Um, I think it's got loads of there for adults to enjoy, um, and uh, yeah, just a, what a wonderful story, really. <clears throat> yeah, it was probably for me um, the book that started a real love of reading for me. I mean, I I, I read a bit before, but. It, but I think that was the one where it, it launched my obsession with it. That, that mm -hmm. kind of understanding that you could enter a world through the written page and 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 disappear into it, and mm. and of course, you know, Bilbo instantly became one of my favorite characters. I, I think in fiction and. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think I read it, and it was like the tenth grade as well. Which, and coincidentally, um, even though I had seen the the animated film as a kid, I didn't remember much about it. But we ended up watching um, um, the film side by side with reading the book in class. So oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I, I I also saw the the animated movie in class. Um, um, I, in, I was in year seven, we call it here, but um, it's basically equivalent to grade seven in America. Um, and we studied The Hobbit, the text of The Hobbit in, in English class. Um, so I'd, I'd already read the book multiple times. So this was, uh, was the easiest class in the world for me. But um, 
I remember uh, I remember the teacher setting us a creative writing assignment where we had to write a short story and and it was supposed to be like a three page story that you'd write as an 11 12 year old um, and I wrote sort of 15 pages <laughs> um, um, in that class but um, but no guys I didn't actually write the Hobbit that was a that was a misspeak <laughs> um, but yeah um, <laughs> Kate. Oh, guys, and we've just been joined by Helen. Yay. She's muted. Oh, you're muted, Helen. Hello, hello. Hello. Hey, and so so we are waiting on Carol. She's having some audio issues. Oh, we're not live? We are. We're, we're live. Oh. No, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I literally ran into the house and switched on the light, and uh, that's it. Uh, so I, I was, as I was saying to Dan before we get on to raving about this animated masterpiece, um, look at we, my we, name, we, look at my name, please. <laughs> we are talking about Tolkien's book and sort of our experience of it, and you know, and how we feel about. It. So, so let's just sort of wax poetic about about the novel uh, first uh, what are your feelings about can you give me one can you give me one minute to set up yeah yeah <laughs> oh i'm professional i'm sorry people yeah you you guys talk i'll, I'll be ready in a second because okay. i want to see the chat uh, and i can't hear i need to use I, I can't get my oh. laptop to work that that's fine, Carol. I'm, I'm glad you made it. I'm sorry, it, it, folks. This is totally my fault uh, because I, I I probably should have done some more troubleshooting ahead of time. But I, I'm I'm glad I'm glad you're here, Carol. I can you just tell the folks a, a bit about yourself and you know a, and what you do. Uh sure. Uh, so my name is Carol Brown. I am a I live in DC, and I am a uber nerd and geek about all things Tolkien, which you will soon find out probably more than you ever wanted to know. Um, other than that, um, I love all things science fiction, um, fantasy, high fantasy. Um, as a matter of fact, I was on with the group last night watching the director's cut of Aliens. And we were just having way too much fun with that. So that tells you what I do in my off time. That's all I do is this. Uh, but I work as a software uh, engineer. And um, so when I get a few minutes of extra time, I try to sneak in a few things. So that's about it. Nice. Um, yeah, so Carol, we are talking first about uh, Tolkien's book and, and, and our feelings uh, about it. So did you want to chime in? Um, we're going to start with Hobbit first, or yeah. all of the the Legendarium. Where are we? Because oh, no, this could get deep. As yeah, you see, as you see, I have my map over my shoulder. Carol wants to to, Carol wants to talk to Marillion like now. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, I love Tolkien, and, and I've been a favorite, a fan favorite of his for many, many years. I got introduced to it in high school. Um, I took a biography fiction seminar course with the toughest English teacher in our school that everyone ran screaming from, and all I saw was books. So when I joined her class, I asked her, um, well, what do you have that, you know, I've read a lot of the books on your book list, and she recommended that I read The Hobbit. Um, and on her wall was pictures from Ralph Bakshi's uh, Lord of the Rings, which I absolutely love. And then there was Rankin Bass's The Hobbit, which mm -hmm. eventually I got to see and giggled over and just just many things. But I love his work. I love the fact that the, the, the imagery that he does without being overly preachy. I love the fact that he created his own language. I like the fact that he drew from his experiences in World War I. Um, and the fact that my favorite character in all of the books is Smaug because Smaug is my dude, man. I'm just, I love him very much. <laughs> That's so great. You know what? I remember you guys doing the panel at Con of Thrones, and I remember you saying that. that that's great. I love it. it. It did confuse a few people, but I mean, come on. It's like Sauron. Smaug was very up to the point. He said, look, <laughs> this is my thing. You sat there and waved some gold in my face. I'm going to swoop in and take it. What you going to do? And then you're going to show up and take my stuff back. We're going to have to have words. And you, 
you don't understand that if I have to come out here and freaking see some villagers to get you, then you be over there and I'll be over here. It's all good. But me and my gold, I'm real complaining about it. He didn't sugarcoat it. He was to the <laughs> point. I've come to take your stuff and now it's mine. So boom, goes the dynamite. Love him. Uh, I love you, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Oh my God. Uh, so are you ready, Helen, to to talk about The Hobbit and, and you know, what, what were your feelings on the book when you? Yeah. yeah. So um, I obviously love the book. And that was, I think I always tell this story, but it was my first English book I ever um, could read or did read. And uh, it's good that it was a children's book because, you know, my, my father is like a weirdo. So he could give me like the Iliad in Greek or something and be like, here, read it, seven year old child. Um, and so, no, it was my first English book. So this is. Of, you know, I mean, Tolkien obviously wanted to create languages and everything, but um, he, you know, it's an easy read and it's just beautiful. And I, for me, it's um, part of my childhood and how I grew up and it's it's beautiful and it's short, which is good. So you can literally read it every year, like just chiming in, like, I don't know, in, a, in an afternoon. Um, it's a very fast read, but still every, every time you, um, discover something new and um what i the thing I, because you know it was kind of a standalone book for for a while it was not always supposed to be part of the legendarium and he changed some things um to to make it fit and i think you can see that um and there th some things are a, it's a bit sad that they were changed like bilbo's story of the ring and everything how he got the ring um but still i i love it um and yeah that's it. It's it's a, everybody asks always the question how to get into Tolkien, and I think literally give the Hobbit a chance and experience it mm. as not his full power and glory, and he can do so much more Tolkien. But it's a good introduction to the world because the most important thing about Tolkien is the world he um, he transports you to, and um, the Hobbit is the best introduction to that world. But again, you know, the story gets better with all the other books and all the other stories. Yeah, I, um, you know, on the note of, you know, it's kind of sad that some things were were changed. I mean, not for the larger story. I I, I enjoy the fact that it's incorporated, but um, but I know there has been talk for it's what seems like several years now about them putting out a facsimile version of the original mm. published Hobbit. And yeah. I, I do hope that that sees uh, publication one day, because I would love to own a copy of the book that is, is the novel in its original form. I think yeah. that would be really cool. Yeah. Same. Yeah. yeah. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. YouTube is very funny right now. I can't, for some reason, the internet is weird in Europe at the moment. Um, and uh, I can't type in the chat. So sorry, hi, hi chat. I can't type. It always says um, it, it couldn't be sent. I don't know what. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, Amy, but see, if you incorporate everybody else, you'll get really drunk. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, well, I, I do want to um, say that I do have this movie on DVD. No! <laughs> so I, I bought this all the way back <laughs> in 2001 when the live action Lord of the Rings films were coming out. Um, so I had actually seen the film when I was originally, when I was a kid, didn't remember anything about it except for the fact that Gollum scared the crap out of me. And, yeah. and then I saw it again uh, in 10th grade when I actually read the book for the first time because the teacher sh uh, had us, you know, like read portions of the book and then he'd show us a little bit of uh, the animated film. And, and so we kind of went like that, which is might be why I'm a little more positive on on this than than many people are because I think it went along with my discovery of the book. So so there's actually a lot of things that I kind of carried over into my reading, which might horrify you guys. But, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um, 
but but yeah, let's <laughs> let's go ahead and get into it. Um, where on earth do you guys want to start? <laughs> At the beginning. Well, well, I'll tell you what. Let me let's set some context. Let's set some context, and then uh, uh, the 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 fury of Helen and I will just jump in the middle of it. <laughs> but to set a little to set a little context. Um, so John asked us to read this book and we'll uh, read this book uh, to watch the the Hobbit, and I was like, okay, this will be great. And then you know he said it was going to be the rank ambassador, and I was like, oh god. Um, so so to set a little context, um, the version of the Hobbit that we're talking about, the movie, the animation. Uh, those of you who may or may not know, Rick Bass is a uh, uh, magic. Uh, in a company that started with um, uh, the two companies, Jules Rankin, uh, Jules Bass, whatever, in 1960. And they were known for partnering with this uh, Japanese animation company called Top Magic, uh, Top Craft. And they came up with what was called Puppet Tunes. And for those that may not even remember this, because they went out of business in, I think, 1987 or some such, um, they are known for Santa Claus is Coming to Town, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. They did the Osmonds. They did the Jackson 5. That's what they're known for. They're known for cute, cute holiday you know, fantasy. Their style of animation is very round. Pretty big eyes, or that sort of introductory, introductory Japanese stuff. So really good, lighthearted fun. And then for some unknown reason, in 1977, they decided let's take on Tolkien, and the rest is history. Um, I think the reason why I had both at the time it was interestingly regarded because pure Tolkienites were like, dude, you left out like three quarters of the book. You know, I would argue, you know, nine tenths of the book. Um, it was very commercialized in the way that it was done. The animation was interesting because, again, they're part of to do the 2D animation where they're doing claymation and that 3D type of stuff. And the way that they interpreted the book, you can hear some of the narrative of the book in what they tried to tell in the story, but the rest of it, oh my days, the rest of it. So that's just to give you some context. So this is this great company that was known for doing one particular type of thing. Somehow he got onto Tolkien and um, Rankin, or Rankin I think was a fan of Tolkien and he always wanted to do it. And the reason why he did it is that he thought that it was still in the public domain, which was arguable by, by the copyright arguments that were going on at the time. So he just jumped in and did it and took the fall. But yeah, so that's, where we're starting, how he ended up there. And then I'll let you take it from there, John. Um, yeah, and by the way, Carol, uh, I, I don't know if there's anything you can do, but you, you are uh, a bit choppy. And so y your audio kind of is uh, cutting out at times. We're still catching most of what you're saying, but uh, but just so you're aware of it, I, I don't oh. know if there's anything you might be able to do. Okay. All right, I'm going to work on my laptop to see if I can get the audio to work, and I'll let you guys go ahead and talk, and if I may pop out and pop back in. Okay, all right. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, Didn't um, Rankin Bass also do Thundercats? Yes. They did. Because yeah. yes. yeah. you... Yeah, because I'm a bit younger than some of you guys, I think, maybe. Um, so I don't remember a lot of the stuff hey. from the 80s. But um, <laughs> but, um, but I do know Thundercats, and I know they were involved in that, and that was good. Yeah, uh, a lot of the sort of animation and, and like music sound effects, it very much reminds me of Thundercats, um, mm. which maybe is why I have some affection for it, because uh, I loved that show growing up. But, um, yeah, I am just starting off with one of the opening images of, of the movie. I actually think that the animation is quite beautiful. I, I, I know that, you know, certainly I agree there's room for uh, complaints about the interpretation of certain things. But, but I actually think the quality mm -hmm. of the animation is, is pretty nice. And I, I, I like the look of it, even if some of the designs are... A bit off, but but here's our character Bilbo that we start off with. Um, can I ask a question, Jordan? So, um, who or, or panel? Um, who was because I literally didn't have time to research this, but um, who 
what was the audience for this? Was it really just kids? Or because this is what I was wondering about when I when I saw it. I remember I saw it as a kid. Um, I wasn't born in the 70s. I'm not that old, Dan. Thank you very much. <laughs> a few. Um, and um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so who was the audience? Was it like six to 10 year old children? Or do we know anything about that? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I actually tried to find some interviews and, and stuff about this. Couldn't really. Uh, there's probably something written somewhere, but I, I certainly couldn't find any um, like retrospective interviews or anything like that on, on YouTube or anything. But one assumes that it was made with uh, kids in mind, maybe talking you know, fans who are of all ages, but, um, but it certainly, you know, seems to be a, you know, designed with, with kids in mind, even though, you know, as I said, there's certainly some stuff in there that would freak a kid out a little bit. <laughs> yep. Well, but you know, I mean, Grimm's fairy tales are like that. Like people die, people got, uh, mm -hmm. they, they cut off hands and, you know, so, I mean, it, it's not always, um, um, unicorns and rainbows in, in fairy tales, so that's perfectly fine and not even, well, I mean, Disney, yeah, painted maybe another image, but still. Um, so I was just wondering, because is it a Disney children audience, like, you know, like those 70s, 60s Disney movies, or is it a more, oh my God, educated, like, people who know talking, because there's a big difference, and that was would be one of my points where I criticize the movie, but if, if it was made for like an audience who liked Disney movies and who liked dwarves and stuff like that, then it's perfectly fine. If it's for another audience, no. <laughs> I don't I don't know that we know. I do I will I will say with John, I agree with you on the animation, um, the 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 richness of it and the the detail that they put into their animation was, you know, very, you know, beautiful to see. The problem that I think that the Tolkienites had was that it was at that anime style and very likely whatever they had in their mind for the book, this didn't translate. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, Peter Jackson said when he was doing Lord of the Rings and they were talking about Ents and Hobbits that they brought up uh, Rankin Bass and he almost had a heart attack because he was like, no, absolutely not. The trees look <laughs> like carrots. Everything looked crazy. No, no, no. Um, but what they were trying to say is, is that there was that lighthearted, childlike aspect to Bilbo that really doesn't quite translate to the book. But I see where they were going with it. But the style and the and the, the rendition of the countryside of Hobbiton and the the lonely mountain kind of looks like a flat pancake with some sticks in it. Um, some things they got right. Some things they were, you know, very much stylized. Uh, but from the animation standpoint, I will give you that one. But I, to Helen, to your point, I have no idea if it was geared towards what age switch, you know, range of kids, but the, it was definitely marketed for that Saturday cartoon, yeah. you know, That's feeling because the music was ever so much over the top. Um, <laughs> it was, That's it why was, John loved it so much. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, oh, but that was the thing. It was more so of a more recent nostalgia type of a thing to tie into the music that you heard on his claymation type stuff. It wasn't really taking you back to the time. And I think that's why the, the purists have such issues with it. But from an animation standpoint, I will give you that. Well, Sa Sanri is a professional animator in the chat. She's shitting all over the <laughs> I <love> animation. It. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sanri. I, I, so I, where I love it, it. Hey, man, this is 1977. It was, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. If you look I, at it in context I think, of today, I think hell the, no. um, the environments are beautiful. It's just the character design is all over the place. That's it. I mean, just saying Thranduil, like, what the F, people? <laughs> oh, wait, do, what, oh okay. my God. Do we Elrond just wanna... with the halo. El, Elrond with the halo. Oh, my God. <laughs> Why? <laughs> people but... in our uh, watch party uh, the other night were saying, what, uh, what a fabulous halo. Yeah. <laughs> 
And and can we talk about this? He has a beard. It's not okay because no. only Dan had a beard. Yeah. Why are you hung up on the beard? I I don't. And Gandalf's it. hat. Of all and Gandalf's things. hat. Why is Gandalf wearing a hoodie? Talk talk to me about that. We need <laughs> the hat. <laughs> <laughs> Wear a hoodie, yo. I mean, come on. Yeah, it, it's not okay that he has a, a beard. Like <laughs> everyone doesn't have a beard, just Kirdan, and that's canon. So not okay. <laughs> Aaron, I'm ignoring you because he's not. Yeah, <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> Aaron um, said that Elrond yeah. is fabulous AF. No, he's not. Yeah, it's like. <sighs> When I first saw the movie, I, I don't think I ever, you know, bothered to think about, you know, the hood instead of the hat. But it, it, but when I was watching it the other night, I was like, that is a really weird design choice because <laughs> Gandalf is so like iconically, you know, wearing the hat and the hat. And, and how do you uh, decide to, you know, eh, we're not going to do that. <laughs> I mean, you know, but we're not even going to get into, you know, we're not even going to get into the fact of how he portrayed the elves. I will, I'm the elves, the dwarves. To be honest, the dwarves are probably closer to the yeah. depictions in the books yeah. um, than anything else. I'll give him that one. But Gandalf, man, come on. Yeah. I was just like, he's wearing a hoodie. He's got on a robe. <laughs> Why is he wearing a bathrobe, yo? It's like, um, put your hat oh, yeah. on. I do want to comment on the dwarves because I, I think that's always yeah. been one of my main sticking points about the uh, the live action films was that, you know, God knows I love Peter Jackson and I will forever worship him for the Lord of the Rings films. But he you know wanted to turn the dwarves into the heroes of the story. And they're not that. <laughs> True. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I I am fond of the fact that in this version, the, the dwarves are, are pretty much, uh, you know, as they are in the book, you know, character wise. Mm -hmm. And and they certainly look more like dwarves than than they do in the films. And they, they have the colored hoods and, and stuff that they have in the books as well. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. The outfits are actually right mm -hmm. in terms of canon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still yeah. they remind me, and see that's I mean I'm definitely not a, a Hobbit movie um, apologist, right? So I, I'm not the biggest fan, but um, how they portray not the acting and and the character, but look wise, I preferred it because these ones look for me like Disney dwarves, and. Um, I think the dwarves in the Hobbit movies look more like the North mythology dwarves, which they are based on. Um, and I don't think that these ones are very, I, I don't know. It, it, they felt literally like the dwarves um, of uh, uh, Snow White. Does she have the dwarves? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Snow White. yeah. <laughs> <She did. laughs> Were the dwarves? Uh, so I, yeah, they look like that in that. You know, remember that sixties or whatever Disney version? They look like those ones, no? Yeah, and and again, you know, uh, I, I um, think nine, okay, twenty. Sanri says, yeah, but or yeah. thirty-seven, whatever. Yeah, okay, it's really really old. I remember that, but yeah, they they look like a ripoff of those ones. I prefer the ones in the. Live action and and Tolkien hated the Snow White movie as well. Like he, he there was there was a correspondence between him and C.S. Lewis. I don't know if yes. you've got to that part in your book of letters yet, but yeah. Um, but there was a whole a bit between those two where they were just basically yeah. just hating on Disney's interpretation of the of the poetic Edda, wasn't there? Yeah. Well, I do think that there's a sort of happy medium, and he's called Gimli the Dwarf in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, so. perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> he is the perfect dwarf adaptation, yeah. I, I would say. Um, yeah, Aiden Turner is not my idea of a dwarf in the Hobbit films. I'll just say that. <laughs> um, but this is not merely just... Don't you need uh, to let Carol in again? Yeah, I, I know her picture isn't showing up, so that's why I was waiting. Um, hmm. Yes. Yeah. 
I don't know. Oh, there yeah. she is. Can uh, can we hear? Her? Oh, we we don't hear you, Carol. No, we can't okay. hear you. Oh. No, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yay. <laughs> mm. Perfect. This is what happens when you have an engineer. It's like I was over here on my laptop figuring out what happened and then switching over. Ta da! Did it. Um, I will say that, you know, again, the watching this movie in school kind of went hand in hand with my reading of the book. So I will fully admit that the fact that these dwarves remind me of the, the book dwarves is, is due to that. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm obviously biased in that regard. Um, but, but I, I just like the fact that they're not played up to, to be heroes in, in this. I think somebody in our watch party basically said, you know, when, you know, we got near the end of the film and the, the battle of five armies is about to start and they're arguing over the gold. And somebody said, the dwarves didn't do shit. And it's like, <laughs> and that is, you know, accurate to the book. To so, the book, it is. Yeah. yeah. And it, but it's so cool they, they had uh, the bird because I never got the bird. I didn't remember that from the Hobbit book, um, you know, with, with a talking bird that then spilled basically what Bilbo and Smaug were talking about. And um, I love that they got the bird in hair because in the Hobbit movies, I just recently saw them. They were on on, on TV and, um, well, there was nothing else on, so I, I watched them. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I never got, because you can see that black bird in front of um, um, Turin, in when they were like standing behind these big stone walls and the elves uh, the elf army in front of them in front of the lonely mountain and uh i never got the thing with the bird but it's it it was a good interpretation of that because it's important um yes. in 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 this version but john out of interest what did people were there people in your streaming group um that never read the hobbit book and saw that movie for first time and did they even understand what this is about because that is my complaint overall um it is very speeded up mm. and um did did they even get the what this is about or because if you i haven't watched it in years and i watched it this morning and i was like well, this is very fast and i was always criticizing you know making three movies out of that tiny book yeah but then a lot was left out and speeded up, like the whole scenes. In it was also, remember, it was director TV as well. So like yes. you've, got you know. you've got advert breaks in there as well. So that's part of yeah. the problem. Yeah, I, I know. I mean, they, they can't definitely make it longer than one and a half or two hours. That's totally fine and clear. But it's weird because the book is so tiny, but there's so much in there. So much yes. happened. And um, and you everything was speeded up in, in this version. I was like, if anybody doesn't know the Hobbit book, do they even get what this is about? <laughs> Not at all. I don't know. Nobody mentioned that explicitly, but I do think that somebody said that the, um, you know, having seen the, the three live action films, it made this make sense for them finally. <laughs> so I guess they oh. were able to follow it. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I certainly can't answer that because like I said, I was reading the book and seeing this simultaneously if we could go back in time and ask the little kid version of me who who yeah. saw this for the first time um maybe i'd be able to to answer that but i, no, I, I don't know little john. <laughs> <laughs> well that sounds wrong but you know like young john <laughs> sorry very late yeah it it, 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 it it definitely informs your experience because if you've read the book and then you see this, you're just sitting there with your head hurting, going, <laughs> okay, I'm going to get through this. Because this was me last night. Yeah. And then when, you know, we were chatting earlier today before we got on for this, it was like, poor John. 
It's like, oh no, <laughs> we're these crazy people. But to be fair and to play devil's advocate, um, I see what they were trying to do. I see that he was trying to compress a lot to get this in that TV, you know, afternoon before the kids go to bed yeah. kind of thing because it was very marketing oriented it was very much in the style of his of, of their pre, pre, previous work um and which was fine but when you read this book and you look at their interpretation it just didn't connect oh my god those are the trolls they just <laughs> no 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 and, and, and this again they, really now over here I'm this triggered. again really reminded me of thundercats a lot yes <laughs> especially the trolls so uh, see this was me in like high school um when i was you know seeing this really for the first time i saw it as a kid but i didn't remember it so this was my first time and and so me being newly exposed to Tolkien's work, my reaction was more of, oh, hey, cool, that looks like Thundercats, um, rather than, oh, my dear God, what have they done to the trolls? Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I do think it's kind of, you know, it depends based on your individual experiences, but I, I totally get it. Like S Stephen commented last night when that scene came up, he was like, and those are not trolls. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And he's not even that big of a, you know, he, he doesn't, you know, care for the books that much. He's more of a movie guy. So, so even for him, he's like, what the hell? <laughs> now people in the chat are saying, um, it looks like Dark Crystal and this is why you love it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Tivia Major said that. It's like, yes, it wasn't an afternoon thing. It was shown in prime time. And you can tell, you know, because the, the breaks were in there. You know, it wasn't told as a movie. It was, and now from our sponsor, Chip. Yeah. Okay, now we resume. Doop, 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 doop. I'm like, oh God. I never drew that connection, guys. By the by the way, so then I I love that you're you're making that comparison for me. <laughs> um. Talk I, about I, the missing sound. Did you make them watch it without sound? Yeah, yeah. So here's the thing. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll have a technical talk for a second. The version that we watched because it is the the widely available version, and the picture quality actually is the, the best. Uh, is missing a whole bunch of sound effects. Um. <laughs> so oh my God, why did you make them watch that? Well, because you can still watch it and, and get everything. It, it's just the the experience isn't, you know, it, you know. You guys would probably say the experience is going to suffer no matter what, but but um, but you know, there are especially in like the more action oriented scenes, like with Smaug attacking Lake Town, and you know and the battle of five armies, that's when you do notice that there's, uh, there's something missing there. Um, so, and even, I think Steven actually did remark upon it. Uh, he was like, you know, by the way, the sound design on this is kind of crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I will say it sucks as, as a fan of this film, I, I would love for WB to go back and, and fix it. It's been screwed up since 2001 when they originally did the remaster of it. Oh my uh, God, Steven says when a dragon breathes fire, it's completely silent. <laughs> 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 That's horrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh no, Lady Leaf Underhill says, my household unsully said he saw it in the theater way back then. Was he thinking of something else or was it in the theaters at some point? No, not? I, he's probably uh, thinking Ralph of, uh, yeah, yeah, which I will say, I like this better than Ralph Bakshi's Lord <gasps> of the I do, I don't care, I don't care for the, uh, the Bakshi film. They're, they're, they're both deeply flawed. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> but, yeah. but I, I, I'm with you, John. I, I, I don't like the Bakshi at all. Yeah, at least it's, like it's really even, if you have, even if you have complaints about this one, the music keeps you entertained throughout. The Ralph Bakshi version really falls apart, you, you know, in like the last, especially the last 30 minutes or so. Oh um, my God. The music on this one, I was expecting Care Bears and unicorns and sugar <laughs> to drop out of the ceiling. And see, this is one thing that I will not apologize for. I love the music in this. It's so, though I will say, little known fact, I don't know if anybody does know this, but the goblins, when they go to Goblin Town, that was Thurl Ravenscroft singing that. Mm. And he's the one that's saying Mr. Grinch. Speaking ah. of women, yeah. Here's your goblins. <laughs> yeah, no, those aren't goblins. <laughs> oh my god. No. Yeah, they, it's, they look, they look like, like the loath cat in Star Wars. Yeah, maybe. Um sort of the ish. Yeah, she wasn't a Mandalorian as well. They do look very feline, don't they? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah those aren't goblins. No, it's my cats when they're hungry. <laughs> you have goblins. <laughs> I have goblins. See, I, see, I'm loving this because, like, and you know, I should be right on board because I'm such, you know, a, a huge Tolkien fan. But it's like you guys are like that. You know, Tolkien is spinning his grave, and meanwhile, I'm looking at this and thinking, but it's so unique. It's like <laughs> you're not oh, getting it's any, unique. You're not getting any other Tolkien adaptation that looks quite like this. I think. Yeah, yeah Gremlins. Yes. Yeah. Gremlins. Yes. Yeah. Gremlins. Yes. Amy, Amy says Cheshire Cat, which is what I was thinking of from um, <laughs> Alice in Wonderland, maybe. Cheshire yeah. Cat right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Aaron M says you should retitle the stream "Friends Dunk on an Unapologetic John." She's just <laughs> jealous that she's not on here to do it herself. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but but if we talk about some of the sections of this, I it was so compressed and it was so um as as Helen said, it was so rushed. I mean, they didn't there was no Bjorn, there was no Tom Bombadil. If anybody would have lended himself to being well, first of all, Tom is, in, Tom, Tom is in Lord of the Rings, so he's not in the Hobbit. Ah, true. So. But even so, going through the forest and meeting Bjorn and, you know, going through all that, because there's yeah. some critical information that they get in that in, yeah. in that interaction, and they just skip past that. Um, well, the story of the swords, like, they don't even tell the truth about the swords, that they were, like, forged in Gondolin, and he literally looks like it. That's the name, that's the name, boom, next topic. Like, no. oh, that's important. No, this is Elrond. <laughs> um, let me read my... Oh, yeah, look at that. Um, okay, so the, you need to follow this. Okay, here you go. There was, it's, like, <laughs> it's the moon runes. These moon letters. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but but Gandalf is sort of subtly corrects him because Bilbo's like, what are moon letters? And he says, runes that can only be, <laughs> read, yeah. you know, at night. And and so I feel like maybe he's throwing Elrond a little shade in that moment. But but El but but Gandalf threw himself under because he said, oh well, I can't read these letters. I don't know what this is. Yeah. And let's go over here. And then Elrond's like. Yeah, this is my um Walmart list. And it's like, <laughs> oh rooms, moon rooms, what's wrong with you? <laughs> oh god, yeah. Oh really. my god. But I'm sorry, and I'm still triggered by the Halo Elrond with the yeah. bags under his eyes. I'm just like <laughs> he deserves another look. Oh no, he doesn't. <laughs> Not at all. We haven't even got to the wood elves yet. I mean, oh, El yeah. oh, Elrond, Elrond was, um, was like quite, you know, accurately canon accurate compared with the, the wood elves that look more like goblins than the goblins do. Mm. <laughs> what were those creatures and the accent? Like, why does Brandon have a weird accent? What's the thing with that? Yeah, it sounds like, sounds like an Indian not... accent, maybe. Do yeah. Wood Elves not wear pants? I mean, yeah. what is that? Why are they that color? 
Why do they have trees growing out of their head? I just oh, sat there okay. with. I mean, but I could get over oh. the trees, but I mean, that's just wrong <laughs> on so many levels. Why you know, are so their legs so long? Are they trees themselves? Like what? Why are they blue? First of all, like since well, when are well, they some, blue? Somebody was comparing them to uh, in <laughs> Game in, in Game of Thrones the. Uh, Children oh, of the forest. The children of the forest. Children of the corn. <laughs> you that mean that, like we are the weird elves? I'm like, what is the <laughs> why? And actually, you know, the, the scene in in the Hobbit, the scene in the Hobbit is so cool. You know, when the elves always disappear. Yes. And yeah. Dark th Pistol. This was because that that is also. This was the thing about it being rushed as well, because that whole bit yeah. is just like a journal, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And actually, um, like, look yeah, at him. What is this? What yeah. is this? Show him again. Show him again. Sure, I mean, yeah. now, people, yeah, go, everybody, go can you can you remember the Thrandro from the Hobbit movies? Yeah, Lee I mean, still, Lee Pace. Hello, Just think Lee I Pace. Was, This yeah. is Orlando Bloom's dad. Yeah, like no. <laughs> I mean, Orlando Bloom must be like this. Can't be his dad. People like what is happening? No, no, no. Look at him, and he's Lee gonna. Pace. Lee Pace as Ronan is going to show up and be like, okay, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> Take my hammer and <laughs> slap y'all around. Look at this. Like, this is not okay. And I mean, the it's the same race, right? So how is Elrond with a halo? Like, and a no beard. Yes, but it's what? Elrond after all is, is uh, half man, you know? Yeah, but still, Even the other Elrond, half elven, and his brother still have the affectation of a humanoid. I know. I'm what just trying. I'm trying that? to give them anything. No, <laughs> like no. what is like what is this? This is like di di like picturing them as they are evil, and that's not okay as nope. well. Like not okay. And him speaking in this. What is that? What would you say? What is that dialect? I'm not a native speaker, so well, I don't... this is what happens when they, for some reason, decided it was a uh, good idea to cast the film director Otto Preminger. Yes, as, as the Elven I saw King. That. It's and like then... you pretty much know what you're getting at that point. <laughs> Who was it? Orson Bean, and I as was Bilbo. reading up on that. Yeah. It was like actually, you know what? I'm I'm just gonna say this now. I'm quite fond of both uh, Orson Bean's performances, Bilbo and John Huston as Gandalf. I, I, yeah, John Huston is, is awesome, but, but they yeah. cast those, and then who are these random people who are doing these voices? That's <laughs> kind of where. Maybe you know, they're you like, okay, we, we, we blew our budget on actors, so then we just yeah. were like, hey, dude, at the bus stop, come over here, read this. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> in a weird accent. And Very you'll bizarre. Be <laughs> Take them to the dungeon, yeah, or whatever it is. Yeah, it's just, yeah, I, I agree. It's not a high point. <laughs> because I'm, you wonder what were Rankin and Bass reading the book when they were high when they got to this point? This is not how John imagines this stream to, to, to go. <laughs> well, like, I was expecting uh, maybe <laughs> overall a mixed vibe, and then, Helen, you were going to go to town on it, but, you know, but in a lot of ways, this is better. <laughs> You're so yeah, nice. because, I mean, there's, there's always Carol. She, she always has a good... Sorry, Dan was uh, commenting b before we started that most of my streams are basically, uh, you know, propaganda. Propaganda was the word I used. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, ne you never, you never review anything that you don't absolutely love. And, uh, and okay. you can just be, you can just be glowing about it constantly. So this is the first one that hasn't been like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so Dan, you're saying I'm, that John is Elrond with the with the Hilo. He's glowing. Um, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, show, Just show us where the moon rooms, yeah. <laughs> Kate, Kate Brzezinski says it must be something in those Florida oranges, yes, it probably is. Um, <laughs> but you know what? I'm still putting in, you know, 
the, what is all, Sanri all, drawing? All the effort I can. Sanri, what are you drawing? Like us or oranges? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, think, I think John John has Elrond. I think that's what she means. Yeah, please make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and make, I was right. And make and make Carol make Carol Smaug, make Dan a wood woodland elf, <laughs> and make me a goblin. I am Smaug. I'm I am that. Fire. I can't wait John, to do that. I am Rond. deaf. John Rond. Hashtag John Rond. It's canon now. <laughs> John Love it. It's a third I, brother. It's a third I'm brother. The unknown San brother. Sanry is actually making completely uh, different art for me for the, the channel, which was supposed to be, you know, uh, me as a hobbit. But you know what? Depending on how this turns out, we might just have to go with the, uh, <laughs> the Elrond picture. Sanry, Dan is the British guy above me. In the T-shirt. Yeah, she knows. Um, <laughs> but she says, "Who's Dan?" Oh. <laughs> what? Oh, we've we've spoken before on the uh, Here Be Dragon Slack. Yeah. I'm the, game, I'm the games developer. No, yeah, he's a British guy. Yeah. The other one. Anyway. It's oh, yeah, I, I, I had, I had missed that, Helen. I, I didn't realize Dan was British. Oh. Well, the girls don't. Um, so it's uh, woodland, woodland, green, green thingy. Wait, hold on. Sorry. I know. <laughs> this is going to be chaos. Sorry. I feel like I'm drunk, but I just have tea. It's weird. Is that, <laughs> I'm sorry, is that I'm Long just... Island iced tea? I'm sorry. Tea. I'm just loving it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's tea. So yeah, I didn't understand <laughs> from this whole misinterpretation of the Wood Elves. Um, I, it's hard to understand. If I separate from the story, if this was a separate thing that they were doing, it's all Dark Crystal. His voice just was distracting. Um, well, but even if you me. look at the, the animation aspect of it, it's fine. But it's you're too busy trying to you, it, it, you're just distracted because, like you said, you're getting that Thundercats vibe, but it's supposed to be, you know, Tolkien, which it isn't. But then you're hearing Tolkien being spoken. Yeah. And I mean, I've heard of interpretation, but wow. Yeah, but see, this just makes it easier for all, you know, all the Tolkien adaptations that were to come because, like, by comparison, you know. <laughs> the interpretations have to be closer to the mark, right? Well, when you're dealing with such a knowledgeable fan base, yeah. who has had this work forever. I think if this were in modern times, I was reading an, uh, uh, an assessment that said that this would be 67% Rotten Tomatoes if Rotten Tomatoes was around back then. And mm -hmm. I said, that was generous. That many uh no but every iteration of trying to re retell this story you are going to have the fight with the fans who are just that's not canon and this wasn't canon this was this this wasn't a cannon this wasn't a gun it wasn't a cannon ball we don't know what the heck they were doing with this but you can tell that he loved the work and he was trying to get there. Cause this was, I think this was Rankin who was the one that was promulgating this, but it, it was just too many things going on here, man. It was just too much. Yeah. And this <laughs> is why I asked the question. To yeah. the stream. The, yeah. the stream gives it 25, 25% <laughs> the, the, pan, the panel, the stream. I don't know. I think I can get a couple more percentage points from, from Oh, Dan. to us. Okay. For, for, no, from, I was saying from Dan, because he's, you know. Yeah, I like, I like, there's things I like about it. Um, Tell I, us. I like, I like the painted backdrops. Um, that first shot that we showed of Bag End at the beginning, mm -hmm. beautiful, perfect Bag End. Um, I like I like the songs um, because people who haven't read the Hobbit book probably don't maybe realize, but it's very very musical. Like the whole book yeah. is very very yeah. much full of music and song. Um, 
And I think they, for the most part, most of their interpretations of the songs are pretty good. Um, I like, you know, I like Bilbo and Gandalf's voice acting as well. Um, so I agree with John on that. Um, but then, you know, obviously it is rushed as well. Um, so, you know, I, I've, my review is that it's a mixed bag and it's a very sort of mixed bag first attempt at trying to adapt to Tolkien. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they have in the books, they have amazing graphic editions, right? Like, so there, there are so many um, artists um, in various publications, even in the 70s. Um, and you could draw because these are obviously... Um, you know, like a Tolkien estate said, yeah, you can use them. So this is somebody like Christopher, who then probably said, this is what my dad would have liked, even, you know, after Tolkien stuff. And why did they then make the, the woodland elves like this? You know, this is what, what I don't like uh, about it. Not just it's different because, yes, you know, you can, if you if you draw stuff, it, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent like it is in in a book but the thing is there are versions out there and there are ideas out there and for Tolkien um he visualized the elves he told us exactly how important hair color is how important and that person who, who made the movie must have known that so I think it's actually rude to portray the woodland <laughs> realm as kind of these whatever that is stick people blue stick people um <laughs> so it, you know it, it that that is strange because if you like talking you must know um looks and um you know eyes hair and all that stuff genealogically whatever that's called um <laughs> and also even within like the elves that we do get the wood elves that we do get like they all look the same as well yeah that's the other thing like they they all look like the well, same even a couple elf. of them even a couple of the dwarves look, the, you know, the same. Yeah. Like, like mm. Feely and Peely are, you know, I mean, I suppose you could, you know, chalk it up to maybe they're supposed to be identical twins, but they do look like exactly the same. Yeah. And, and, and even Balin and Dwalin are, are, are almost exactly the same character, except I, I think Balin has glasses. So. I don't hate elves. I love elves. <laughs> I just don't like blue blue stick figure thingy. Um, I will say, even though I agree that the woodland elves are just a gigantic WCF, it, it, but having said that, you know, it, you made a comment about you know why are they made out to be you know villainous? But in truth, I mean, let's be honest. In, in the Hobbit, the book, they are you know, the characters of the woodland elves are presented as sort of, you know, antagonistic from our perspective. Um, cause, cause we're coming from the viewpoint of Bilbo and the dwarves. And, and so, you know, the elven king does, you know, lock them up. And, and so they're treated, they are treated as an obstacle, you know, in, yeah, but in the books. Just in the yeah, but just in the beginning, later on, and you must see a book as a whole, right? And the story as a whole, when you create a movie and when you create and draw races and people and whatnot, because in the end, Bilbo actually respects and Thranduil also respects Bilbo um mm. so yes in the beginning but that changes and they then become more and more even thrandra becomes more and more like okay he's not that bad and especially i didn't like how lee pace had to portray him in the hobbit movies because that's not the thrandra of the books he's actually a really really good king hey he's not greedy and lusting after jewels that's not true yeah i'm mm. just saying that i i can see how this is someone adapting this might say, uh, okay, you know, let's lean a little more into making this person uh, slightly villainous. It's, it's kind of the, you know, it's along the same lines of Peter Jackson deciding that Faramir had to be an obstacle to, to overcome. I'm not saying I agree with it, but I'm saying I, I can very much see how, that's a tempting route to go. Now, there's no excuse whatsoever for the um, visual depiction. <laughs> I can't really come up with the 
another excuse for that one. So I'll uh, yep. so I'll, I'll go ahead and go with you guys on that. It does. The spiders were good though. The spiders are good. Yeah, I like. I, the I, I I do want to mention uh, <laughs> we did have to say goodbye to Carol for a little bit because uh, she has a, an appointment she had to keep at at three o'clock, but she, she might be back in about a half an hour. So yeah. just in case you guys are wondering where, where she went to. Um, Carol had yeah. enough. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I have a fighting chance now. No. Um, <clears throat> no. Uh, yeah. No, she, but, she's still here. She's just put her magic ring on. But even the, the spiders are a bit. <laughs> they're, they're odd. <laughs> I mean, there's well, one right there. Well, for animated, I, th I think they were okay. Like, what is really scary and also annoying? And that scene was compared to all the other scenes, which were way more. I mean, yes, the Bilbo and Gollum scene is really important for the whole legendarium, right? Um, but Gollum, he was so annoying. Like, I watched it having breakfast and I was like, oh, stop it. Like, you are so annoying. And the scene is <laughs> way too long compared to the length of the movie. No, yeah. Gollum. Yeah, Gollum. So I, I actually got really sleepy when I watched this scene the first time around. Um, yeah. I watched it a couple of days ago and I had to re watch it at the end again. Okay, um, this is where I stopped playing nice because actually <laughs> the, the, the Gollum scene, it's my favorite stuff in this film. And, and, and actually, uh, I quite like this interpretation of Gollum. I mean, I, I love, you know, the, the film version. I, I, I think obviously Andy Serkis is fantastic, but this. This whole scene has like a sort of creepiness vibe to it. That yeah, they they really kind of you know formed my sort of interpretation of Gollum uh, reading the books, and so I'm I'm quite fond of it. And no, no, don't get me wrong. This that is totally fine. I just think the scene was too long. But then again, in the in the book, the scene is pretty long actually. Um, just, you know, it takes you out of the, the movie for a little bit. But I think that just overall, like, the, the pacing in this movie is off and weird. Um, and, yeah, I, I like that that dialogue and everything. I just, look, look at those two, right? And you in the in the animated ones or in, in, the, in the original three um, Lord of the Ring movies, you can see that Gollum was something like a hobbit before and here you can't again which maybe the eyes but that's it and that's weird because he look just looks like a creature you know like another random creature and he doesn't look like something that was once similar to a hobbit yeah that's fair yeah, yeah. um <laughs> Aaron says why is it called him a fish yeah exactly i i, I would say frog he looks frog. like a frog yeah he looks yeah. like a frog yeah yeah, I've I've heard a lot of people say it looks like a frog. Yeah. Um, but I, I again, I I do like I I think the scene is actually quite chilling, and I I do like the end when you know. Yeah, the, I was going to say that. I, I do like that moment where his eyes light up. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah, and the, the, the yeah. way it ends with you know, you know, we hates the baggins, we hates it forever. It, it's yeah. you know, it's bone sort of you know, bone chilling. And so, so I, I do rather like this portion yeah. of the film and yeah, it does go on for a while, but you know, and riddles in the dark is an entire chapter. So it is. I, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. It, it, it always worked for me when I was younger and, and I quite, and I, you know, and again, I like the fact that it goes on because again, it's probably my favorite part of, yeah, of the film. So I don't mind spending, yeah, some more time on it, but, um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry. What? Okay, what's going on with this? Are you guys just finding ways to? Uh, I think that drinking when drink. somebody mentions something. <laughs> when somebody mentions Bilbo, the, you know protagonist of the story <laughs> somebody's gonna get hammered 
Well, but let's talk about Bilbo. How how did we did we like him besides the voice? Did did we like? Oh no, you like the voice, right? Yeah. 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 I I very Bilbo. much like yeah. like Orson Bean's yeah. performance. Yeah. And again, I mean, I I have to say that I came to the to the book with this visual image in mind. So I think even now I still kind of instinctively think of of this version of Bilbo when I read the book. So I, I, I don't know <laughs> whether that would be considered a good thing or a bad thing, probably a bad thing. But I, I think it's mostly Orson Bean's voice and performance. I I just like it. I, I don't know. And and I think it sort of helped, you know, Bilbo become a favorite character of mine because uh, I, I, I think he, he's quite likable in this and, Yeah, I, I don't know, and and then I I loved you know when we came around to the films, getting to see you know Ian Holm, you know, put in his uh, his interpretation of the character as well. But yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not going to be too shy about the fact that I think that that this version of Bilbo is pretty good. But yeah, it is. What what I do like about it is that he is the protagonist, and he is actually the hero. Yeah, um, yeah. and that's that's how it should be. Um, and it's so um, beautiful that he says, you know, when he says uh, that he wouldn't, this is the story he wants to write. So he has to memorize everything. And when yeah. Gandalf tells him, I don't really remember, what does he tell him? Uh, take notes or something. You, you, Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like that moment in the forest as well, when he climbs up above the trees, which is straight out of the books. Um, and he says to himself at that moment, I, um, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go back home or not. Um, yeah. Which is kind of a little bit of a callback to the to the books um, where he's constantly um, repeating the same kind of thing about wanting to be back at home. Yeah. Um, yeah, and have, I find And it, you, you do get a sense of that hero's journey with that inner you know, monologue with him. Mm -hmm. I do yeah. find it interesting that they actually made time for this moment because, you know, as you've said, mm -hmm. Helen, it's, you know, well, both of you said it's, it is really rushed. It's another bit of really poor animation this moment, by the way, because <laughs> um, those moths, um, for anybody who didn't watch along with us, um, those moths that we're seeing, we're seeing on the screen there are all flapping their wings in time with each other. <laughs> um, but yeah, sorry, I cut you off. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> He's not a fan of Bilbo, apparently. No, I like I liked the way he talked and the way he also talks to the audience, right? Um, so he takes you out of the movie and he talks to you, and that's actually cool. Oh, Sanry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but you yeah. know what? No, wait. If we're going to complain about elements just being copied, can we? Uh, let's just not forget to mention the fact that when the army of elves shows up in the live action Hobbit Battle of the Five Armies, they are literally yeah. all cloned elves. Yeah. <laughs> in a live action film. So I'm not going to give this version grief for copying mm -hmm. some butterflies. And, and, like, we're talking, like, soldiers who are, like, up front in the battle line. You can see them clear as day. Next time you guys watch the, the live-action <laughs> version of The Hobbit, look for that. It's really bad. <laughs> Is it? I do not remember. Because I must say, I like the Battle of the Five Armies, like, the scenes. Hmm. I liked it, even though it was not correct and not how it went down in the books. But I kind of liked it. So you think it's bad animation, bad? Yeah, it's bad. Mm -hmm. It's lazy CGI. CGI, it yeah. um, The fact that, which would have been helped by, you know, if they had gotten extras to actually be on set instead of filming the whole thing in a green screen studio, you know, maybe you'd want to shoot a battle out on location. I don't know. That's just my Did thought. Did they not? Did they, they not? Did, no. Uh, oh. Some of it they some of it they did in with the uh, with the citizens of Light Town in their like mm -hmm. separate you know portion of the battle, but like actually on the battlefield in front of the mountain was like all green screen stuff. 
And, and two and, towers was that uh, outside film? Two yeah, towers, yeah. Right? They, they they did a night shoot. Okay, and Pelennor Fields as well, I assume, because Pelennor Fields, I do not. Yeah, some of that was on. You know, they used sets and and some uh, location shooting, but Battle of the Five Armies was. Yeah, I. It was one of those things where they were running really behind on the, their scheduling was all screwed up. And, yeah. and so when they actually had to shoot the battle, um, they had to go back to finish shooting the battle. And so mm -hmm. a lot of that, a lot of that stuff was just done with the main actors on a green screen set. But mm -hmm. even so, you know, if you, you're put in that position where you're going to CGI your army, just maybe try and make, those CGI sh soldiers look a little <laughs> bit different and not the exact same, you know, person. It, it's well, maybe I, you know. I, I think um, I think Azog looks very digital as well. Actually, like yeah. even the even the close sort of like facial stuff isn't really on point. Um, yeah. In the in the yeah. Hobbit movies, and they spent a lot of time on it, Azog as well, but. Mm. Um, there was a comment here. Erin Erin is saying I was still confused by who the five armies were. Well, you clearly haven't seen the animated Hobbit, the Rankin Bass Hobbit, because Bilbo counts them all. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. There's I two like armies. That. Wait, no, there's three. Mm -hmm. There's four armies. <laughs> uh, and the eagles. Yes. So it's uh, it's the it's the the men, the elves, the dwarves, uh, the goblins, and the eagles are the five. We do actually get a talking eagle. Yay! In this. <laughs> yeah. They that didn't sound very enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> no, no it's what? great. It's great that they do talk. Peter Jackson didn't have them talking. Um, yeah. Again, the the character design, not sure. Um. <laughs> but is it in the book, John? You just read the book. Uh, was it really what Guaihe said that Gandalf saved him when he was hit by an arrow? Is that what he says? I do not remember that. Uh, I don't know for sure because I actually didn't just read the book. Um, oh, okay. So it's been a little bit. So I, I don't know for sure. I I, I, I can't answer that. Yeah, I do not remember that. I was like, "Ooh, that's odd." That that, sorry, was that, that, that the question about Gandalf like uh, healing him or something? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that is that, that is in the book. Yeah. Is it in the book? Okay, yeah. good. Then, then I pretty, just pretty sure it is. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a weird thing to make up, and yeah. then make him talk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's like um, uh, the eagle says to him, uh, Gua here says to him, um, you know, I, I owed you a favor because you helped me out that time in the book. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's something like that. Okay. <laughs> so, guys, what was your favorite song in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, down, down to Goblin Town, down. <laughs> I like that one. I like that one, I think. Um, yeah, I, I'm um, sorry. I'm, I'm just remembering no, last night. Tra -la 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 down in the valley as well. Oh my god! <laughs> Epic. No. Stephen was like, "That is not appropriate music for Rivendell," and no. I, I actually found it quite fitting for the Rivendell that's in the Hobbit, because you know that exact, in, that exact song is in the Hobbit. Yeah. yeah. Um, because um, in the Hobbit, Rivendell is not really meant to be this you know elaborate big place it's you know it's called the last homely house and it feels like it's you know just a small cozy you know yeah. place for them to rest so i actually think that it's uh that that song works really quite well there um i love all the dwarf singing i think it's I love that in the Hobbit movies because it gave you chills in the Hobbit movies. Like it's just beautiful. And you can see, I, the thing is, I always think of the dwarves like, um, and I think I, I, I read like something about it that Tolkien 
want them you know there there's a lot of talk of talking um being an anti-semitic and um he he that he doesn't like jews and that's why he portrays the dwarves like they are but he portrays the dwarves as the dwarves of the north mythology that's it that's nothing else and um so he um the you know the diaspora of the jewish people like they had to leave their homeland and they're always traveling somewhere they had to work in foreign countries adapt foreign cultures um and live there but they still stayed amongst themselves and they um didn't teach others to speak their language they adapted the language of the people surrounding them and then this is what the dwarves actually kind of are based uh, on in in Tolkien and you can feel that and see that and especially in the um live action Hobbit movies you can see that and hear that in the songs they're singing because if you know Jewish folk I mean I'm Jewish so I, I know a lot of Jewish folk uh, songs and um it is very very similar um to what the dwarves like the 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 rhythm and the sound and the the feeling it gives you um so it's very similar and um here it was a, a bit like that um it was obviously way shorter they didn't have that much time to to sing the long songs but um I like the feeling of it yeah so I love the dwarf songs. Hmm. Yeah, I <laughs> I think I still always have uh, their initial song. Uh, what's uh, blunt the knives? You know, it is always sort of in my head when I read it in the book. Sometimes even to the point of no, let me get that out of my head so I can actually try and read this as, as, as Tolkien wrote it, but it's a catchy tune. <laughs> hmm. And then, uh, yeah, and I, I do think the, the Misty Mountains and Cold uh, song, the, the way it's, it's sung is very evocative and it plays over the, the flashbacks of, uh, of uh, Erebor, you know, when the dwarves are there and it shows, you know, when the dragon attacks, I, I think that's actually a really good scene. And there's some uh, John Houston uh, narration mm -hmm. and uh, over that. I, I, I quite like that stuff. But um, <laughs> I mean, okay. So we haven't really talked about smog. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that would that would be Carol's favorite part. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll hold up. She might be back in about ten minutes. So yeah, we'll, no, no. let's let's go ahead and hold off on that. Uh, <laughs> I'm laughing at Sandridge. <laughs> Kill me. <laughs> <laughs> the cat vibes are back. Yeah, the dragon is a feline looking cat. It is true. I think it looks more wolf like. I would say. Yeah. The snoutiness. Um, I think they made that choice with him. Um, sorry, we were going to hold off, weren't we? But I'm stuck now. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they made that choice with him so that he can speak. <laughs> yeah. And the, what do we think about Lake Town? Like, um, mm. compared to the live action three Hobbit movies. Um, See, now, the, this visualization of Lake Town is closer to what I would imagine yeah. late time mm. to be versus what they did in the live action films. I didn't mind the live action version, but it, it was definitely a different, a different look than I thought. Um, yeah. yeah. This is very, that could be from a Hobbit book from publisher X, Y, Z that could be in Hobbit book. This I, is... Yeah. I think it goes to what Dan was saying that a lot of the, sort of environments and stuff look really good yeah. It, yeah it's it's the character interpretations that are yeah. that are kind of off the wall yeah it feels it feels as well like it was um designed by two different teams as well like it was there was yeah. you know, they, i don't know how it works but maybe you can fill us in john but um it feels like they outsourced the character design to somebody else um to me 
Um, the set is something different than the characters. It, yeah, yeah, the style is so different. Um, but yeah, I like the visual style of, of Lake Town. Um, but that section of the movie, plot wise, was a little bit rushed, and we didn't get the master of Lake Town, who's one of my favorite characters from the book. Um, yeah. yeah, and Stephen missed... Fry was so so good in the um, oh live my action. God, yes, he was. Yeah, I mean that's not necessarily my favorite stuff in the live action. But I, I, I think some of the humor is a little goes a little too far. Um, Kate, Kate Patinsky says, "May I just say, Burt Reynolds was great in this movie." <laughs> <laughs> As Bart, the, he was not even the bowman. Bart, I, the... I, see, I went to Tom Selleck. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Tom Selleck. Yeah. And even look at the look at the humans. They are all cloned. They're cloned. Look at them. They all look the same. Or is that like is Lake Town very? Is everybody related? Are these? That's a very large family. What you're seeing right there. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. I mean, it was the seventies. So I'll oh, give it. Henry. But what I really liked about this is. Because that was BS in the Hobbit movies, right? With the black arrow thingy. Because it was a normal arrow that is completely... And, you know, with the sun and uh, climbing to, to that top. And then um, him and the sun and the last arrow, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, no, nah, that, that was not what happened. It was, yeah, exactly. It was just a normal arrow that hit Smaug. Because we knew from the bird that uh, that was his weak spot. Yeah, I mean, even though it's extremely abbreviated, like the this stuff is just sped through, but it is a truer interpretation of, yeah. of you know, Bard and, and then the way Smaug is killed and, and all that. But, uh, you know, like everything else with the live action movies, they were, you know, filling out the time because they wanted to make, you know, you yeah. know, give grand character arcs to every, you know, tertiary character in the damn story. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, pretty much Amy. That's, that's what they did. Um, what dog dragon is a better dragon than that Smaug? <laughs> I mean, the, what is a what dog dragon? Is that some from some commercial we don't know? Or? Yeah, I don't understand that reference either. Uh, I don't know if I, I think that's a reference to our ongoing jokes uh, about. Um, is a hot dog a sandwich? Yeah. Okay, it's that. And it's, you know, I know at one point it morphed into, you know, is a hot dog a dragon. So, so I'm sure that's. <laughs> My cat would be a better smoke. Can you? <laughs> Can you smoke? Teddy. Her name is Teddy. Because she's so fluffy like a bear. And she likes belly rubs. Yeah, I, I I think the whole stream is derailed now because 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 clearly, uh, yeah, she's more important than anything we're talking about. I'm of course. sure. She's so fluffy. Show them. Look at the belly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm a crazy cat lady. So, um, yeah, I'm still trying to avoid going too far into Smile because I, I do want to try and wait for Carol so she can go off because I'm sure she will. <laughs> she will. Oh, my God, she's fired up. She's talking to her boss, and she didn't, I think, I don't know, whatever's going on there, but um, she probably after you're talking to your boss, unwanted, you're fired up anyway. Um. So, <laughs> but anything else from the rest of the film that you guys want to talk about? 
Um, what haven't we covered? Mm. Uh, let's... <laughs> we haven't we haven't we haven't talked about Gandalf a lot apart from the whole moment of um his hoodie. Wait, yeah, I mean we talked about his hoodie and we talked about his voice acting. Um <clears throat> Yeah, I mean I like his you know yeah. you know the performance and the way he's portrayed just yeah, the <laughs> the, the the fact that the hat is missing it's like mm. it's a hood. It, it's for some reason, it really bothered me a, a lot more the other night than it has in the past. Um, like, why? Yeah, but the portrayal, I, I think he was, you know, because Gandalf is not a just a sympathetic character. He's not. He is that, you know, he has a mission and he wants that mission to, you know, he, he wants the dwarves to succeed and he has um, always a greater picture in mind than anybody knows because Gandalf is a Maya and he knows a lot and he was sent there for a purpose. And I think here they, I think they portray him really, really well. I liked it. I like that. He, he was my favorite in here. Bilbo and Gandalf. Bilbo, medium, Gandalf, yes. Yeah, and... I do like the fact that, I mean, and this is just from the fact that this is a straight adaptation of The Hobbit and not any anything else, but, um, you know, I, I hate to keep leaning back on comparing the, the versions, but I, I rather like that we get a Gandalf who, you know, just disappears for stretches and then, you know, mm. and comes back because that's a major element of the book. Yeah. And and so I like when he just, you know, I was a little I was a little bit disappointed. Uh, the first time he disappears is when the, they encounter the trolls, and I was a little bit disappointed with that disappearance um, because it's in. I mean, it's again, it's rushed um, in the in the Rankin Bass, um, but in the book he comes back and he imitates the voices of the trolls and plays them off against each other very cleverly, and and then he keeps them there for ages. But in this, it's just like, ta-da, magic, sunrise. Yeah. Um, which is a bit like kind of a cop-out. Because yeah. that seems really cool in the book. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this definitely is just um, magically making the day appear rather than, a, yeah. as you say, distracting them. Um, look, Sanry, don't you dare feel one bit awful. This has been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason why I keep popping she up. Just your says, she it. just says it. She doesn't feel awful, and we know it. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, Lady Did... Deep and there are no lion people. Um, so I, uh, I'm not the biggest Game of Thrones fan. Fan. I mean, I like it, um, but I, I never remembered the house names, and so I called people and Sanri, I, th I think Sanri was on that stream even and I call people water people, sand people, dragon <laughs> people because I did not remember the house name so those are water people and lion people so I'm obviously um, a, a lion people, lion person, lion people um, because I love Cersei and I'm a Lannister and that's what Sanri and I always say we don't like we don't do water people we are lion people <laughs> I love sand people as well. Like, <laughs> yep, I'm a Lannister. Of course, I'm rich. I'm just not blonde. <laughs> I, I feel like I, I need to make this very clear. I do not like the laser eyes. I'm yeah, kind of no. like, what on earth was going on there? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in the same way, it's I, I, I didn't care for the Watchtower of Sauron in the live action films either. Because, oh, I like it, that. It, it, you know, I look, I love, you know, pretty much everything about the movies, but it is like a giant, you know, flashlight. <laughs> it's like a, yeah, it's like a big CCTV camera, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I came back 
just in time. Yay, right. Carol is back. All right, Carol, we're, and we're discussing we Smaug. We tell, tell us how much you loved this interpretation of Smaug. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> besides the halogen lamps in his, in his head, though <laughs> the interpretation of that is very much like the book. Um, yes, yeah, true. Looks like red light, green light. Um, his his voice, the, the the imaging that he was trying to get across. I think, if nothing else, from a monster standpoint, this one didn't as, annoy me as much. Um, it could have been a lot better, but this one, I think they focused on. Uh, sorry, because my phone. They focused on. Um, yeah, my phone sounds more more monstery than Smile did, but I think he was focusing on the book. I think they kind of like dialed in on this. I think the animators really could get their their teeth into it. Um, I don't know if he was so much a dragon than a wyvern, um, but this one didn't annoy me as much. I like the fact that they they did kind of get a little closer to the book in the interactions between. Smaug and Frodo, Frodo, Bilbo, trying to go back and forth with the riddling and his, you know, over to the top, you know, uh, oh, you're so great. Oh, magnificent Smaug. Please don't eat me. What can I do to get out of here? Um, I even like his snark. He was, the snark was in there that I wanted. Um, so I try not to compare this one to um, Peter Jackson's smile, which was done beautifully. But I would say this one was acceptably closer to the book. Yeah, I I think my only real issue with it is from a visual standpoint. I'm not sure why he looks like a cat. Well, <laughs> you've got elves looking like yeah. you know goblins and goblins looking like Loft cats, so why not a feline? But he was a predator. I mean, he came across not, you know, too friendly or all of these other things. Um, <laughs> thank you, Sam Rixian. Um, but I think it, it's in in the same style that they were animating. So yeah. everything was a little rounded off. It wasn't really a nice elongated snout of a true uh, dragon. But if you keep it in style of everything that they did as far as their anim animation style, it works. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like... I feel like we're making a progression towards less hostile as, as, as we go along, which is my plan all along. Keep hope alive, uh, John. Keep hope alive. <laughs> but yeah, and again, I, I do like the fact that it's closer to, to the book and, you know, <laughs> this, this was not supposed to be a, me. It's funny. You guys are writing on this, and meanwhile, I'm spending all my time writing on the live action versions. Uh, the film as, as a counterpoint to it, but you know, I, I don't really care for the finale of Desolation of Smog with the whole um, you know fight between the the dwarves and, and Smog. So I, I I do like the way this the fact that this is like the book and it resolves with uh, Smog, you know, going off to you know to you know take revenge you know on late town because he thinks that's where bilbo has has come from and so yeah i, I like the way it it all plays out and you have to also understand that both uh pieces were pandering so you had that hollywoodish i'm trying to make this over the top and to your point the the dwarves were paying a much larger and aggressive role in, you know, the the live action than they were in the book. Uh, but then again, there were certain things that just made absolutely no sense in this one. Uh, but this one was not intended to be a feature film. This yeah. was something to do, prime time, bring the kitties around, and those poor kids 
you know, I'll pick on you. This isn't Santa. This isn't Rudolph, but it's the same, you know, you know, type of type of well, it is the same organization. It's the same uh, animation house. It's the same, you know, showrunners. Um, looking at it from the perspective of everything that they were used to doing for the popcorny, you know, ever so happiness for them to try to go down this this road for something a little darker. It was almost as if they were fighting their instincts to really follow the book because the book gets dark. I mean, the book is into into tropes, into ideas that are very dark. I mean, mm-hmm. you've got just Bilbo who was this innocent hobbit in Hobbiton and all he cared about was smoking and can we please talk about a brief second about the smoke rings and Gandalf popping out behind a tree like a creeper what the hell in his hoodie I'm like all right I'm done to I am Gandalf and Gandalf (laughs) means me it was like you will come with me now I was like put on a hat Maybe I'll listen to you, yo. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get off that soapbox. But as you watch it go through, you can kind of see where it's getting there. But once they get into the Lonely Mountain, there was no other way for Rankin and Bass to do that but to play to the monster, play to their fears, you know. And again, that smile, like the live action, like the book. Oh, you want to mess with me? I'm going to go fricassee up some, some villagers lunchtime, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> but it, it, at least in this iteration, it was that boogeyman under the bed, you know, that kids could relate to. They took the the, the, the monster because even the trolls and Mole Town and all of, I'm sorry, uh, Goblin Town, they touched on the darkness, but they went through it so fast. <laughs> and also, no. uh, somebody made a comment when we were watching last night that a, a lot of the stuff is is presented as you know sort of frightening, but then you have the songs <laughs> overlaid on top of it, which kind of diminishes how dark some of that stuff is supposed to be. But interestingly, for the Smaug confrontation, the music, you know, it, it's. There, it's not like they overlaid it with another song. It's it's underscore, and it's also, you know, it plays to that sort of frightening encounter that the scene is. So it, it's a little bit different in that way. You know, if you think about Grimm's fairy tales, which Helen it raised earlier, I used to have the best, like, uh, leather-bound book of all of the collection of their tales. And the illustration were watercolor abstract. So you got the sense of the monster. You got the hints of whatever so that your imagination could fill everything else in. In this telling, especially with Smaug, yeah, it was an evil cat having a moment with, you know, teeth and extra large, you know, whiskers. But the menace of Smaug was still there. They didn't cut any corners, too many corners on that one, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to connect the dots of, you know, 13 dwarves show up. Yeah, we got evicted from our home. Come help us. Hijinks ensue. Now we're in the house. Can't get the squatter out. Go talk to them. You know, it was kind of getting you there. Uh, So I give them kudos for... uh, maintaining that threat, maintaining that what would you do if you were a little kid and you saw this come out from under your bed, you'd freak the heck out. And here's Bilbo who normally would have fainted dead away. It's like all the stuff that was happening, it was just freaking him out. He said, I don't have my handkerchief. I don't have a coat. What the heck am I doing to he's talking to a dragon? You know, he fainted dead away at the beginning and now he's arguing and negotiating with the dragon. So it's showing Bilbo's growth. Yeah. They did capture that. Um, I, I do really like his monologue as he's walking into the cave. And, and again, the fact that this movie does take the time to really focus on his 
personal journey, his, his growth throughout the story. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one of my, uh, definitely a favorite element to, uh, of me for this film, because Bilbo is the hero of, of the story. And, and so I, I'm happy to see that, that evolution. And, and you know, and he's focus on it. And he's also the writer, you know, the Red Book of Westmarch, and obviously um, there and back again, that, that's him writing it. Well, the Red Book of Westmarch, partly. But um, what I didn't like, come back again to that, is in the beginning, you don't see him. I, I was gone for a second, so maybe you talked about that. But in the beginning, you don't see him hesitating that much. And I think in the live action, it's better portrayed because exactly what Dan said because then he goes up that tree and says oh my god I don't really you know then he has that sense of adventure and I I am now on this epic adventure and I don't I will never be the same person again when I come back home do I even want to go back home he had that experience and this is what Frodo also had in the Lord of the Ring movies because none of them were ever the same person coming back to the ever, Shire, not ever, even Sam. Ever. Yeah, and in the beginning, you don't see him hesitating. He was just like, oh, yeah, okay, this is the contract, let's go. And that's sad because they had that scene in the tree and him growing with smoke and all that, but they didn't have it in the beginning. So, again, lazy. Again, it was, it was glossed. It was compressed. Yeah. Because yeah. the, wait, a what? A where? He wavered a little bit and then it was like yeah okay fine it i mean you don't see that they left and he came to that decision and then yeah. followed yeah. follow through yeah, he, yeah. He, he, has that, that. he has that moment in the books where he's just he sort of starts running out of his house without realizing yeah. which is how, very anti hobbit and he did, which is the yeah. point is that mm -hmm. as you go into it's lord the, of the rings it's the took side coming out yes yes yes, yes. And I don't and, know. <laughs> And, you know, even at the very end of it, you know, I, I thought that they didn't hit it hard enough in the live action uh, because you have the uh, saxophone baggins have come in there and have just took his stuff and they've sold everything and he's watching his stuff go down and him just realizing it's just stuff. That's why when you look at Frodo, sorry, Bilbo at the very beginning of The Hobbit, and you look at Bilbo at the beginning of Lord of the Rings, it's two different experiences yeah. because he's not really materialistic, whereas he's a very well-known and wealthy hobbit in the beginning, and he's very much about how, what, how am I perceived, how do I look, how am I going all of this? And then you see him in there negotiating with Smaug, the original Bilbo, to Bilbo's point, I mean, to, to Helen's point, Bilbo didn't, he wasn't given enough of that developmental starting point. Yeah. So that when he landed, you saw that payoff. So yeah. it was kind of hard to, so it was, too, it was too compressed. Yeah, exactly. But the end was, perp, you know, the end was good. The development was good, but you, you must develop from, somebody hesitating or somebody you know there must be a problem so because then you develop and grow but that wasn't explained so i yeah. do like bilbo's sort of squeal at the beginning though when he finds out exactly what gandalf has arranged oh, yeah, 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 yeah. i thought that was fun <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that was good he did a little swirl which goes along with in, in the book uh yeah, I, I think it's Thorin that says, you know, it, or maybe it's Gandalf, excitable little fellow. Mm -hmm. That was Thorin. Yes. And and true to the book, Thorin was very disrespectful. Yeah. You know, yeah. and yeah. some of the and, um, dwarves were Glo very... Glowin, Glowin has that line um, in the book as well, where he's like, um, he looks more like a, what does he say? A um, farmer? A grocer, that's what he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, looks more like, he looks more like a grocer than a burglar, um, mm. <laughs> which I was miss I, that I was missing that line in both adaptations actually. Um, yeah. Because um, you, when you see Glowin in, in the Lord of the Rings, because you meet Glowin, who's Gimli's dad, for those who don't know, 
um, in the Lord of the Rings. Um, that's what I'm thinking of is that line. Cause that's like his one line in the Hobbit. <laughs> actually, actually I will say Dan, that line, uh, it looks more like a grocer than a burglar. That is in the live action film. Is it in the live action? I don't remember. Is it? So, yeah. I, I just remember I, I love the, he just, the stank that was on his face when he was like, really? Him? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, and there was just some of that aspects of that that were missing in this version. I mean, however, I will say the crack the plates, these are the things that Bilbo hates. I yeah. love the fact that that carried all the way through. Yeah. But sometimes the music was distracting because there was music when Elrond was talking and then there was this underlying hobbity music. And it's like, you need to kill one of these because it's, <laughs> It's hard to hear what he's saying, but like I said, I think it, they they hit their stride as they get closer to the Lonely Mountain. Yeah, and again, I, I will say a, a lot of <clears throat> a lot of sound issues like that can probably be laid at the feet of the technical, you know, bundle that Warner Brothers has, has done with the film. So. You know, so hopefully one day that'll get addressed. Yeah, for me, Warner and, for Brothers me bought them, or he they became a partner, was it not? Because Warner Brothers was not a part of that from the very beginning. Because yeah, yeah. you had Topcraft, you had Rankin Bass, then there was a couple of other people who came on board with this. Um, but when they decided to do The Hobbit, Rankin Bass went back to Topcraft and said, we need to do this. Now, the funny thing is, is that the last piece of work that they did before this was the same year was the year without a Santa Claus with Heat Miser and uh, Snow Miser. So when you look at some of the the monsters and some of that affectation, especially of the goblins, it was the year without a Santa Claus. And so it was them taking that 3D, slapping it in 2D. And again, I maybe there wasn't enough time for them that prep to make sure that they took that step mm -hmm. back and do what they did. And the smog scenes, they really did those, you know, again, a hairy cat, but uh, that breathes fire and has halogen lamps. Sure. <laughs> but that was as close as they were going to get to the book because in the book, it does speak about him waking up with that one mm -hmm. eye yeah, in yeah, yeah. the beams I was, coming I was gonna, through. I was going to say this. They, they, the corner that they did cut with Smaug was that Bilbo goes into the chamber twice in the book. Um, he goes in the first time and Smaug's asleep and he steals the cup. And then he goes back in and Smaug's pretending to be sleeping. Right. And Smaug knows that one bit of treasure out of his whole hoard is, is all, gone. All of it. Which is super creepy because he's like yeah. he's got an itinerary in his head of like every bit of treasure. Why um, he's awesome. Yeah. My stuff. Um but when you when you cut that corner, you kind of miss that element. Fine, fine. Like, <laughs> who made yeah. my stuff? Yeah, yeah. Helen and I did a stream about Glaurung um, a while exactly back. And we, we, we said the yeah. same thing, didn't we? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was so cool. We loved Glaurung. You would have loved that, Carol. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. <clears throat> I like the beasties. I like the baddies. I like them all. I, I love that they have very particular roles that they play and very distinct personalities. They're just not evil or nasty just for the purpose of being evil and nasty. Yeah. I mean, yeah. even the Balrog, the dwarves delved too deep and were too greedy. And yeah. that part kind of got glossed over in the over in the, um, uh, uh, the narration in the beginning. I mean, the dwarves, you know, uh, under the Lonely Mountain look like, you know, the tasting thing going through Trader Joe's. I was like, oh, look, I'll have some of this. I'll have some of that. I was like, where's the, 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 the grandness of it? And the speaking of, they almost called their own doom, which they did. Mm -hmm. Some of that wasn't clearly... I thought laid out in the beginning. So there's a, a difference in detail and and depth from the beginning than when you get to this part of the of the yeah. of the movie that I think. 
Yeah, even I mean, hello, Melko and Sauron. I'm, I mean, Sauron, I mean, we don't learn that much of him being a, we don't know anything really about him from before he was working for Aule, I think, or for, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for Aule, Aule, was he? Yeah, so before Melko corrupted him and he went to Ada with him, but uh, to, to Middle Earth, but, um, Melko, I mean, Carol and I had that stream about Melko and, you know, like what went wrong with him and when did it went wrong and is he, is he redeemable? Is he, does he have any good qualities? Is there like, he's, yeah, he's such a cool baddie. Um, and he, he could care less. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and what, what, yeah. I'll and what do you that. say? I'll give me that. I don't want to work for it. I'm just gonna just cause mayhem and shenanigans. Yeah. What do you mean I can't have this? I mean, he's like a evil toddler on yeah. sugar, and yeah, could not care less. Um. Yeah. So, and you know, one of my favorites is Ungoliant because the only person Melkor was afraid of was Ungoliant because no, he was he, afraid of 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 um. Uh, oh, what's her name? The creator of the stars of um, Yvonne? Varda. Oh, Varda. Oh, Varda. Yeah, and of Tukas because he didn't, you know, like he he didn't like. It said in the text that he was afraid. He was afraid of them. But I mean, yes, direct confrontation with with uh, with Angolian, Yes, that that's definitely because Angolian was and a lot like Smaug. I have an agenda. You made a promise, and then Melkor tried to go back on his word, and Uncle Lion was like, "Excuse me, that right there, that mine. You promised. <laughs> Give me. You what gave you your promised. word, and yeah. I will eat you if you don't cough up that trees, cough up the fruit, cough it all up." And in that moment, Melkor realized, "Okay, this one is Cray." Yeah. And perhaps I need to little pick up my little silmarins and go on up down my little way because he was just like, no. Because she was there like, you know, so that's what I love about Smaug. Smaug was straight wrong. But how do you call a dragon? Pull up all this gold, have this greed and avarice. It rang the little, you know, dragon bell. And they were like, ooh shopping and he shows up and said i'm not going to just show up and live here i'm going to just burn all of this out so yeah. that you have no reason to come back or be here nearby so when bilbo is in that dialogue with smaug even in this it was i i, I enjoyed that you know i enjoyed yeah. the 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 level and the depth of the of the the flattery and the, the, the conversation and Smaug realizing, yeah. oh, I don't think I've was, smelled your kind before. Who there was you? a lot there was a lot of bits there. There was details that they got really right. Yes. Actually. Like um there was when they're coming up to the Lonely Mountain, they comment on the dragon smell, um, which I thought was pretty cool. Because, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that you know Tolkien's actually remarks on in all of his dragons, because going back to Glaurung again, that's remarked on in the Children of Hurin story. Um, mm -hmm. and that element of like the stench of a dragon and just like um, the desolation of Smaug as it is in The Hobbit and you kind of do get a sense of that a little bit kind of, it's still rushed but yeah, they, pay, yeah. they pay lip service to it at least which I do appreciate Yeah, they're not understanding the dragon sick because mm. it's something in the in the smell and the, and the odour that if you're in it too long it mm. will infect yeah. you and yeah. then with the the dwarves with this whole thing with the greed, they just, in a sense, the dwarves and the dragons had a lot in common. Yes, that's what I always mm -hmm. say. They're very similar. Very. Yeah, maybe it made them more dragon-like, you know, the rings. Because the dragons <laughs> were always, they were always who they were. That's how Melkor created them, you know. We learned when we talked about Glarung, you know, we Dan and I talked about, well, what was he? Was he like a because he can't create from scratch, right? He needed something and he needed to breed. To and it's from. even said, it's even said that he bred in uh, in Angband. Um, it was in Angband, right? Yeah, I think in Angband, in the pits of Angband, he bred creatures like Smug, uh, like, uh, like Glarung. And um, so, yeah, 
it's a cool thought that the dwarves became dragon-like. Well, think about it. Aule decided, hey, what if I make this little stuff over here? And Yavanna was like, dude, really? Okay, I'm going to have to make this to counteract that. And then, you know, he shows up and it was like, you too? And Helen and I talked about this. He didn't do to Aule what he did to Melkor. No. Because yeah. Melkor stepped out of line. Again, here's the music. Here's what, how this is supposed to go. Here's how we're all supposed to follow this. Melkor is like, no, no. And he's like, slap. And then here comes Aule making dwarves. And the <laughs> only reason why those I, dwarves were able to stay alive if I may, I'm is they sorry. woke up. I, I just made a video about um, Aule and the making of the dwarves on my channel. So go check it out, people. Oh, cool. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah love do that it, whole Carol. Story. We love yeah. that whole story. Helen, yeah. Helen voiced the voice of Yavanna as well for me. Oh, nice. It was cool. <laughs> um, okay. And so <laughs> we're getting we're the we're getting, we're, I don't, people I in don't the chat have think... got no idea because they've never read the Silver Ring. Yeah. They've seen my videos. Maybe they'd know a little bit about the dwarves. But yeah, yeah, I'm, I've just been sitting here like enjoying just listening to you guys go on. This has been great. Um, I the, we are at the two hour mark, so I, I want to go ahead. I just realized that I didn't do any kind of a mid roll because we just all got caught up in 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 the discussion. So I, I do want to talk about what's coming up next. Uh, things are changing up a little bit, guys, because I've come to realize that it was a bit suicidal of me to start uh, trying to do two regular streams a week and sometimes guest on another stream. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm actually, this uh, stream is actually going to be moving to every two weeks. I'm, I, I do apologize for that, guys. I wish I could keep it up every week, but it, it's just a bit too much for me. So, so in two weeks, I'm actually going to be uh, talking about the film Brazil with the Ooh. wonderful, with the wonderful San Rixian. Yay, Sandy. So that's going to be a whole bunch of fun. So uh, please come back for that. So that won't be next uh, Thursday. It'll be the Thursday after, same time, 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern. So uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. And But next week on Wednesday, I, along with a couple other people in the stream, are going to be on Nessie's channel, The Unspun Yarn, talking about uh, dragons in Tolkien. Somebody needs to invite Carol, please. Yeah, Carol, <laughs> get in touch with Nessie because I know she was yeah. talking about it. She'd love to have you on for that. So she would love that. Like seriously, Carol, I mean, you're our dragon expert here. Uh, I everything, if there's no space, I, I give you my space. Everything. I love everything about dragons. It's just I know. something about them. I know. Oh wait, maybe Sandry's forgotten that we're doing. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> She's like, Sanri, you also oh, owe us yeah. you owe us pictures, Sanri. You need to post them. Like, what is happening? Like, is is Dan an elf, a blue elf? Is Carol a dragon? <laughs> is John what was John? John Rund. John yeah, Rund. Yeah. Rund. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, John Rund. Um oh, okay, good. I was going to say, because, you know, we'll, we'll work to now, but it is two weeks away. So, I, you know, we, we have time to, uh, and actually, let me, uh, let me take back what I said before. Uh, I just remembered Sanry's schedule is a little uh, bit different. So I lied. It's not going to be at two o'clock <laughs> on that day. Uh, just stay tuned. I'll, I'll announce the day and time, but it's in two weeks. So that's the important part. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, so what do you guys have going on, guys? Just have the floor and talk about what you're working on. Who's going first? Uh, you. Me. Uh, so I talked about it at the beginning, but I've just started a channel, a Tolkien channel ish. I'm going to do other things eventually, but um, but at the moment I'm doing a series on the Silmarillion. So I'm doing weekly videos of chapter analysis. Um, 
And I've just done, as I said earlier, I've just done the um, Aule and Yavanna chapter where we talk about the making of the dwarves and the Ents and the Eagles. Um, and next chapter will be the Awakening of the Elves for next week. Um, yeah. Also, um, I'm, I've been working on a video which is um, about the um, Azora High um, legend in in A Song of Ice and Fire and like possible allusions to Tolkien in that. Um, mm -hmm. So that will probably hopefully drop at the weekend if I can get it done. I might not have any sleep before then if I get it done for then. But, um, and then next week I'm going to do a book review of John Garth's book. Yay. Um, which we talked about a little bit on a stream, didn't we? Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's what I've got coming up. Um, and also I'll be on Nessie's channel as well with, uh, with these two lovely people. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Yep. Carol, you? Um, you and I are going to be um, streaming yeah. about some we interesting to do, I know. some interesting topics. We have been having a conversation about C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, religion, and the impetus that caused them to write their books because they were very good friends, but their takes on their fantasy were a little different. So we're going to talk about, you know, religion and Tolkien and then some other influences. Yeah, which is, and we actually, we had, we had that stream, that stream existed uh, three times before, and then we always had internet problems and we're not making this up. And no. it always, uh, something happened. Uh, it, it was weird. We, at one point we said either Melkor or God or Eru or whoever. <laughs> name him doesn't want to do, <laughs> doesn't exactly. want to do this and talk about that um, but it will happen carol and i uh, will find a time and yeah we'll continue that's uh, the uh, fellowship of the bling uh, podcast uh, that carol and i have and we had some really cool episodes and a lot of people are always asking when is carol coming back because it's, it's so cool uh, i bribed them yeah, no, 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 people love you. I mean, look at how much love you get uh, in the chat, Carol. You're awesome. Um, yeah. Me, I just like dragon things. You, you do. And no, but Carol is an awesome person. She fed me all uh, last year during the corn. I would have starved without Carol, all of us, uh, all of our house. And she gave me cough medicine. And uh, Carol is cool. Carol is awesome. And I, I'm very I happy. made her a southern cordial which was the first cough medicine I ever had as a kid. And um, you yeah. make it from scratch. You're using yeah. like Southern Comfort or bourbon with honey and lemon, slightly warm to thin it. And then you take it by spoon. And she did the whole shot. And I was like, oh yeah, you'll be good. <laughs> in the morning, without breakfast, without anything, like in the morning, yay, <laughs> shot. <laughs> I was like, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, and Sandra is saying, Carol got us the reservations uh, at the cafe. Oh, my God, that food was amazing for, for Robert's birthday. That was so cool. In Nashville, yep. Got to yeah. have some soul food. Got to have it. Yep, that was soul food. Like, um, yeah, so Carol, Carol and I will definitely do that. And, uh, and, just, and Carol is what... doing a lot for, for, smoke, for smoke screen and other creators as well. Carol is around a lot. Oh, what am I doing? No, you you were you were um doing a lot for smoke screen and other channels and oh, yeah, and... yeah 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 I for the most part um I'm a moderator on a couple of channels and yeah. offer you know uh light humor because I don't have a lot of time to video game so I'll be on Discord or Twitch and heckle, I'm a good heckler. Um, but yeah, I moderate on a couple of YouTube channels. This is true. Yeah. And Helen, don't you have something else you're supposed to be working on sometime soon? <laughs> With literally all of you here. Oh my God, I'm the promiser that doesn't keep the promise now. But you know, it's been like, I explained what what is what is going on. So I have a, a lot, but um, yeah, no, we, John and I will have a stream on John. I forgot the Rohan. It's on Rohan, yeah. Yeah, Rohan. <laughs> okay, that will happen, people. 
one day. Um, Dan and I will talk. What are we talking, Dan? We're going to do um, a live Q and A about the witch king. Uh, the, the live Q and A. Um, so we will do a live stream exactly, and maybe because I'm going to visit Dan, I'm going to see Dan in live yeah. action next week, um, and I'm, I'm going to London. Um, and so maybe we can do it before, or if not, yeah. we just make a drunk live stream from your house, Dan. Uh. <laughs> Um, maybe, yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, then maybe I... Maybe not. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for nothing, Dan. Um, yeah, and I will uh, definitely um, do other uh, collabs and more videos, but uh, give me some time. I uh, I was really, really busy, but the, the channel is still there. Stuff is coming. I, I'll promise. I'll promise. Yeah, so last week it was John I'm working, and this week I haven't heard anything, and 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 now apparently she's going to see you in person, Dan. So I, I see where your priorities. Oh my God! Are. Good job. Was, was that a bus? <laughs> I think I heard the bus go by. <laughs> John is vicious. I like yeah. it. But John, I, you know, we would have seen, all of us would have seen each other in like a week or two weeks, but it's not happening. So Europe is open. So I'm, I'm going to, to visit um, the Europeans. John's like, right. nah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not just me either. She's going to see Robert and Gemma as well. So. Yeah, that doesn't make it better. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. So anyway, yeah, I'll just be sitting here, you know, going through my Rohan notes, wait, we, wait, waiting patiently. <laughs> yep. We, we, we will all meet up in person at some point. Yes, we will. <laughs> it will happen. 2020, 21 is, I'm saying 2020, 2021 is our year. Oh, no. <laughs> Not 2021. John's going to throw stuff at you. Okay, so I just want to say, like, I uh, I had an absolute blast with you guys. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, like, I don't think this would have been fun if I had had people on who you know who were like in agreement with me on 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 this movie. I think it was just absolutely uh, wonderful to to have all this spirited discussion. Um. And I, I, I seriously want you guys, I want you all back on uh, streams in the future. So if there's any movies that you really love, just please let me know and, and we'll, you know, we'll come up with something to talk about. And Carol, it's so great to have gotten to meet you finally. And same, same. And you're just an absolute joy. I, I had so much fun uh, talking. So thank you. And, uh, yeah, uh, so I guess that's it, unless anybody in the chat has any last-minute questions. Uh, or if you guys want to, you know, say anything more. I, I think we pretty much exhausted the discussion of <laughs> of this particular animated gem, as I referred to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Thank saying you, I stand to my name. I'm just saying my name stands, not a fangirl. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Even though even though you weren't here to give me crap, Aaron, but but you were in the chat doing it, so so that's what's important. Okay, so I guess we'll wrap things up. Thank you again, guys, and uh, thank you to everyone in the chat. And I'll see you guys in two weeks for Brazil with Sanri, and uh, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye. Bye.